All right, time for us to get into the Gaelic football action this weekend. It is Dublin against Meath at 7 o'clock in Croker on Saturday evening in the Leinster football final. The Munster football final, it's Cork against Tip in those uh, Tip jerseys that are going to be um, uh, 100 years on from Bloody Sunday. The green and white ones, you'll have seen them on Twitter, they're beautiful. Donegal against Cavan at 4 o'clock on Sunday in the Ulster football final. I'm delighted to say Andy McGinley uh, is here with us to try and preview these games. Andy, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? Good, Jerry, good. I'm looking forward to a lot of different aspects of uh, the weekend. Um, in particular, I'm looking forward to the Donegal performance because so far we've all collectively decided that they are the only team who might be able to keep it kicked out to Dublin in an All Ireland football final. And with that in mind, how difficult a motivational job is it for their management team just to make sure they don't take their eye off the ball? Hey, it's always difficult. I think that complacency is is always a bit difficult to deal with, but. Donegal, the biggest compliment I could pay to Donegal is they almost seem to be reaching sort of Dublin-esque levels of just routine performance. They're doing so many various elements of the game to a really high level and the personnel involved in that, the leaders that they have on the pitch, the men that they have on the sideline, the subs that they have to come on, it all seems such a high level that it's really, really difficult to see them being complacent. Uh, to see them drop in their guard, and it's very hard to see anything other than a thoroughly professional Donegal performance in much the same way that uh, we would always sort of look at Dublin and expect them to be complacent, and they just routinely don't. They're sort of, they reach that sort of Germanic level of, of performance. Donegal seem to be adding strength to their bow the whole time, and, and they're, they're getting stronger with more men coming back. We've seen Jason McGee and and Paddy McBrady came back the last day just when you thought they didn't have enough forward power. Paddy McBrady comes on and gets a score with his first touch just when you thought they hadn't enough big men around the middle. Jason McGee comes on and makes all the other big men look small. So uh, they, they have a real strength. And we've still to see Michael Murphy hit his top form. So uh, for all of them reasons, uh, I, I've... I struggle to see Donegal dropping, dropping their level much. OK, that's really interesting, because that's actually what uh, Mike Quirk was talking about, the leash manager, in, in earlier on in the week. He was saying that it's that level of performance that the Dubs have that actually uh, the Kerry team he played on would have struggled in the games against Clare and Tip and Limerick, because they knew that they were far superior to those and, and they didn't rise themselves for it. And, and no less us, as, as that throne team during that time, it, it really annoyed us that Kerry won a couple of them all Ireland without us playing them. Uh, we, we lost to Meade, we lost to Mayo uh, during them years as well and, and we got put out of the Ulster Championship a number of times as well. So we really struggled to have a really high level of performance. It usually took playing a Dublin or, or a Kerry to bring the absolute best out in us and, and that, it was a frustration in our mentality but that's just the way we were wired. You were that fancy Dan's, why... is that what I'm hearing Andy? <laughs> you, were, you were fancy Dan's, you couldn't get up for no. only the big occasions. <laughs> Unsurprised. This might surprise you, but but the, we loved people thinking they were better than us in Tyrone, and then we that that really railed us, and then then we came out and and produced our best. Uh, what was amazing, like, and it's common in sport. The hardest thing in sport is consistency, and we we lacked that. We could produce huge highs of performance, and obviously Michael Quirk was saying the similar for for that Kerry side. Now I felt they were more consistent than us, but nobody has touched Dublin in, in terms of their consistency. In fact, nobody has ever touched what this Dublin has reached in terms of their consistency. Did they have to almost become a bit boring in personality to reach that? You, you could argue it was, but to achieve that level of sporting excellence and consistency, that is the very height that, that you can get to, and, and they're there. Uh, we're all hoping that it starts to crack, that it starts to slip, uh, and with that, other teams get a, get a potential. But without a doubt, to be able to match them, you're going to have to at least add consistency to your game. And for me... Uh, Donegal are the closest Mayo have, have been very good this year but we've seen dips at other times from them Galway of course are up and down Kerry we thought were coming really consistent and then they, they blew it against Cork so the, the chasing pack is can reach really high levels but are inconsistent the most consistent for me at the time uh, is Donegal and I'm hoping to see maybe not a, an absolutely uh, explosive performance this weekend against Cavan but a thoroughly professional one, and that would only add, for me, the, the credibility that they are a, a real challenger yeah. for, for Dublin. Yeah, like we, we all love those um, World Cups where the big seeds get knocked off a little bit early, but then you hit the quarter-final stage and there's a bunch of nil-all draws that go to penalties and teams who you know are cannon fodder in the semi-final, and it's like, 
Okay, you know, for the for the cheap thrill early on, we actually diminished the entire standard of the tournament later on. There was one other kind of um, theme that I just wanted to ask you about, and that was um, the different approach at, at half time that different teams have taken after the the Mead Kildare game. Andy McEntee was asked about changes at half time; he, he hadn't made any, and his his rationale was, "Well, we were so bad all over the place. Where the hell did you start?" And then he kind of, you know, many of the word off spoke true in jest. He says, "Look, the point was, I knew they'd underperformed." And I wanted to give them the opportunity to go out and show what they were capable of. With the Cavan performances, there's been wholesale changes at halftime in, in terms of approach to the game. They might not have had a whole heap of positional switches, but certainly instead of being defensive and standoffish, they were like, actually, we're going out of the championship here, particularly in the down game. We, we need to do something about it. I'm interested in those dynamics and how much a team can actually change in these scenarios. And... Uh, and why don't they do it from the start is kind of the overarching question that I always ask myself. And every manager asks themselves the same question and every player for that matter asks themselves the same question. Uh, the sports psychologists would have a field day from this, but to be in absolute honesty, uh, some of their answers, if you apply them across every game, they're, they're, there's nothing consistent ab ab about that either. So for, for me, in terms of the cabin one, which I've seen up closest and, and personal uh, it's it's there they demonstrated for me a, a trend that I've seen within the game in that they will have come into both of them games with really cleverly thought out plans with fellas with multiple sort of things in their head about who to track where to position uh, what the team ethos is how we're going to defend zonal kickouts how we want to push up any maybe calls and cue and you have information overload and uh, maybe maybe paralysis by analysis, that old term. But that seems to be then they come out, and for me, they're overthinking it. Uh, and in both the Cavan games in particular, the key is they've come out and they've, they've thrown the shackles off. Now, I think players are so tactically aware now that even when you throw the shackles off and you go for the old-fashioned blood and thunder approach, I still think they're very tactically astute. They know not to be giving it away. There's so many things that are just hardwired into them. At the end of the day, the sort of the blanket defence of that very tactical approach to football has been in now from 2011 to 2012. So a lot of the players have been playing that way from the were minor, actually. So I think it's ingrained in them. But I think at times we're still overthinking it an awful lot. And then, like, Mickey Graham's halftime talk, it, it wasn't a tactical masterstroke. There wasn't players being moved to really curtail things. They, they stopped dropping off. They decided to push up and have a go, have a cup. Here, McGinney lamented Armagh for not having a cup at Donegal. So whilst there has to be this awareness of the tactical side of it, I think sometimes it becomes a handbrake on teams and players are playing the game within their own head. And then whenever they're sufficiently far down, you take off the handbrake and say, boys, we've nothing else to lose. Let's for forget about everything. And what I said earlier is they don't actually forget about everything. They still play a clever brand of football. But actually, just just bring it. Just bring proper championship football. Just cut into these boys and let's see. Because we've stood back off them and we've thought about the game for half an hour and that hasn't worked. Let's flip the switch. The other psychology that is always massive whenever a team has a lead and is going so well in the first half, that's a really dangerous position because the biggest thing in Gaelic football is the thought of choking, the thought of throwing away a big lead. So if you're coming back from... If you're in a game and there's only one or two points in it the whole way... You, you never drop, you're in it the whole time and if a team comes level, you don't care it's the way the game was but if you're nine points up and suddenly you're six points up, that's still a massive gap and yet somehow you feel you're, you're thinking, that's only two kicks of the ball, we're losing this and suddenly the wee yips start coming in the team that's in front and they're starting to crumble and the pressure's on them and the cracks are and they're getting even more defensive to try to not commit the cardinal sin of throwing a game away and they're just seeing it seep away, and the panic gets worse and worse. Meanwhile, the opposition are smelling the blood, and they're coming, 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 coming strong. So there's a psychology within the game itself. Never mind there's a psychology within the referee. You'll start to get a few calls. You'll start a few wee things, a wee help in hand to get you back in the game. That's always there as well. So all of them things are at work. But the biggest thing for me at halftime for Cavan, I wouldn't be surprised with Meath as well, just have a cut, have a go. Meath were much more in the front foot in the second half. They, they went at the game. Suddenly their speed, their forward line was 10 times more dynamic, yet it was essentially the same players. Yes, there was a few switches came in during the half, but it was the entire change in attitude was the biggest thing. Uh, so I suppose giving the players that chance and saying, boys, let's 
we're, we're going to be out here in 35 minutes, let's have a cup. Yeah, do Cavan carry that? Can they bounce from that second half against Down into the start of the game against Donegal? They, they, they have failed to date to get good starts. And again, Donegal are, are such a sort of refined machine at this stage. They will come out and they'll be happy enough if the game's tight and they'll eke their way to a win, which is classically what we see Dublin do. And Dublin don't come out and blow teams away usually, uh, sort of in a game and then next thing w- without even realising that the team's 10 points down. So Cavan will come out. I, I think they, they do tend to be a, a wee bit more defensive. The danger is if you go man against man against uh, Donegal, they have too much of a forward threat for me to realistically do that. You're also going man to man against mid, in midfield where they are really, really strong in, in terms of their, their big men around the middle and their runners from their half-back line uh, are so good as well. Like to go purely man against man on the likes of McHugh and that there is a tough ask. And right across the pitch, you're expecting a team at Donegal's level to, to create openings really quickly. And then suddenly you're behind the game. So I still see Cavan going out and being defensive and staying in the game and knowing that there's a big second half in them. I think they would prefer not to be as nine points down at half time. I'd say if they, they would happily take being four or five down at half time uh, and, and, then, and then playing it from there. And seeing how that goes as well. Because I, 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 the reason I was thinking about the half time stuff was um, I was looking recently at the the game you guys played against the Dubs in 05 in the drawn game where Muggsy scores his famous goal and that kind of has overshadowed but your team was ripped apart at half time like six changes I think mm. six positional switches and um, and it completely transformed the season so it is possible to take what's happening in a game respond to it and then use that as uh, how we're going to play a, a template from now on Yeah I think it was Alan Brogan was leading us on a merry dance essentially uh, from centre half forward that day and then it got swapped around Joe McMahon came in and Conor Gormley went out I think I got moved out as well, maybe to midfield. And uh, the whole thing sort of, we just clicked. But again, Dublin at that stage had failed to win anything. They had been the bridesmaids for a long, it's sort of funny looking back at that, at that time, but they had been the bridesmaids for a long number of time. And critically, we felt certainly in drone that there was a wee psychological weakness there because they'd never got over the line on, on the big day and they had had a number of, of bad defeats. Uh, so we again knew we had, we had much more in us we had much more energy in us uh, and we could bring that in the second half and if we all you have to do is start turning the tide and start closing down that game a wee bit and as soon as you get that you've you're only getting fed by more and more and more momentum and they're only getting more and more pressure onto them so you always know if you can go out and just start coming into it bit by bit by bit you'll always have the chances but without a doubt that day it wasn't just about a change in attitude. The positional switches were massive, so absolutely sometimes that has to be spotted. But interestingly, the trend this year has been more just a change in level of performance of an entire team yeah, rather than sort of positional switches. The other thing, actually, that's very much a feature in this championship, maybe that more so than any other championships, there's nearly always a decent wind. And if the wind is going a certain direction down a pitch that is going to have a big bearing on the tactics from first and second half and a team being defensive and trying to get in sort of two, three behind. Armagh, unfortunately, played Donegal. Donegal had a lovely win in the first half and so that just accelerated. You know, a five-point lead when they were well dominant actually became a 10, 12-point lead and, and the match was over. Uh, so the conditions, as much as the underfoot conditions are having an influence, the, the, the wind conditions are having a, a big influence on halves of football this year. The, the last point that I wanted to make about them, the Mead thing is that actually fair play to Mead for at least trying to build a system that is designed with the ultimate goal of trying to beat the dubs and knock them off. They're not trying to build a defensive shape that will allow them to get beaten by five or six points and, you know, oh, that wasn't so bad. We managed to keep the, the gap down to as good as any other team in the country. They're legitimately coming up with a goal-scoring plan to try and score enough goals to win the game. Yeah, what was it, seven, was it, against Wicklow in the first round and five the last day out? Like, I would doubt if there's been a team for the last 20 years has had them sort of scoring stats in the first two rounds, so absolutely massive. They're going to struggle to have that number of goals this weekend. But absolutely, against Dublin, it is critical. This last several years, teams have continually got wee chances at, at that Dublin defence. But you've got to take them. And it probably is the way. Like, Mayo would have had a couple of alarms if they had taken their goal chances and not obviously given D- Dublin a, a couple of own goals one year too. But 
uh, the goal chances are so critical against a team like Dublin because they are going to boss possession. Your your team is not going to be as good overall in terms of Dublin, in terms of controlling a game, but they will give you wee chances. And so if you can create... And me, they're, they're also playing to their strengths. They've got really pacey men who who want to go direct for goal, really direct to sort of aggressive players. Uh, so they're playing to their own strengths. So the fact that it's both of them things, it's a strength and it's also a, a good approach for taking on Dublin or at least making the most of a chance if Dublin give you it. Uh, so absolutely, it's the right way to go. You will need to score goals, probably two or three against Dublin, to try and overturn their general expected dominance in a game and their ability to always eke out points and grind teams down. We've seen like in games, even when they are behind, they just move up a wee gear or two and grind teams down. So if, if you can punch goals every now and then, you can sit a wee bit deeper, you can work hard and then hope to punch for a, for a major at the other end whenever you get your chance. I give me the little chance here. I don't, I'm not completely writing them off the way in, in previous years. You would have not even thought about this for more than a second. Like I can see Meade scoring three goals and losing... 116 to 36 or 116 to 35 or something like that. Yes, I I would agree. I think Mead have a chance. I, I suppose it's just so exciting the, the the way they played. Now you have to caveat that Kildare absolutely gifted them. Uh, two, if not three, of those goals uh, were were gifts that it would be exceptionally unlikely Dublin to to give them. Uh, the the Mead performances create an argument there, and then Dublin. Dublin is more unknown this year than they have been in any previous year. We know they've lost, obviously, a couple of uh, key personnel. We know they've had a change in manager. We know they haven't played much football in several months, really. Uh, So all of them things are up in the air. Uh, It's given fairly good weather this weekend, which is unfortunate. I would have loved to have seen bad weather and loved to have seen the match out of Croke Park, seeing we didn't have to have a a crowd at it. Uh, But... That being said, you're still expecting that Dublin team to come through. Like if it was last year, Jim Gavin still in charge and them on the hunt for five in a row, all of them factors pushing them on, uh, it's it's a done deal. But this year, the five in a row isn't there. The six in a row doesn't hold that same psychological drive for them, that same mission to be completed. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the level that they're at. We've built our hopes up many, many times. I'm more than prepared to be see a fairly ominous Dublin team on on Sunday. All right, look, great stuff, Enda. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. All the best.